So, Dr. Capson, thank you for coming today. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, ocean acidification is something that's only recently started coming up in the press more and more, and we've spent so much time uh, thinking about and talking about and questioning um, the reality of climate change. Mm. And ocean acidification is the ocean side of it, from what I understand. Can you talk a little bit more about this, this new monster that, um, that we didn't even know we should be afraid of, but that may be a bigger issue? Well, somewhere between a quarter and a third of all of our carbon dioxide emissions, uh, that's from deforestation, that's from tailpipes, that's from keeping our homes warm by burning coal. Uh, they end up in the world's oceans. But uh, when carbon dioxide ends up in the oceans, it doesn't just sit there as water. Uh, it reacts It reacts with water, it forms carbonic acid. Uh, carbonic acid releases a hydrogen atom, but a hydrogen atom is a very unhappy molecule. So it looks for something to react with. That something is often carbonate. And the repercussions of that is that's carbonate that would otherwise be available to react with calcium to make calcium carbonate, which is the building block for corals, for pteropods, for shellfish, for all sorts of things. And so uh, that's one of the reasons why we have seen recently some significant repercussions from ocean acidification, in particular starting in about 2007, 2008, some shellfish hatcheries, and these are places where they grow baby shellfish uh, that are very sensitive, and baby shellfish are very sensitive to calcium carbonate levels, they started losing all their production. And they lost up to 80% uh, of their production of baby shellfish, and the question was asked, what's going on? And the answer to that question was ocean acidification. There were sufficiently high levels of carbon dioxide in the oceans off of the Pacific Northwest of the U.S. that it removed that calcium carbonate block and they simply died. Um, well one could ask the question, why haven't we been talking about this earlier? Why did this just come up in 2007 and 2008 if it's such a big deal? The answer to that is that the scientific community has been telling us for years. We just haven't been listening. Uh, if you go back to the scientific literature, there are some articles, uh, for example, one in Science that was published, I believe it was 2007, that documented the upwelling of what they call corrosive waters off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, but you can go back in the literature further than that, and the, the scientists that were studying this phenomenon realized that this is a big deal. And they were saying this in the literature, it just wasn't picked up by the environmental community, it wasn't picked up by governments, and what in many ways brought this issue to people's attention was this Pacific Northwest oyster crisis. And, uh, yeah, that's, so those are, it's an unusual environmental issue in that uh, we often, we're often globally, we're often aware of issues such as tropical deforestation, whales, all sorts of things, but there's nothing really engaging for the public about carbonate chemistry. That's not an inherently interesting topic for many people and strikes some as, as esoteric. And in many ways it, it took a human face to make people aware that this was something immediate and something that needs to be dealt with. And and who, is, who has that human face been? Is it a community that's affected by it economically? Is it a people who's affected by it in terms of nutrition? Is it scientists? By and large, the, the, the industry, the economic impacts so far have been uh, most obviously manifest in the Pacific Northwest. These in particular are the shellfish growers, but not, actually not just the shellfish growers, it's the people that bought the oyster larvae from those growers. It was the entire shellfish industry in the Pacific Northwest. And shellfish industry in the United States is about $350 million, is that correct? On that order, yes. Yeah. And so it's around 80,000 jobs. Yeah, and that's, uh, and that's just on the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so one could ask the question, well, what about other parts of the U.S.? What about the Northeast? Mm -hmm. uh, ocean acidification has been more, it's like climate change. It shows up in uh, some places more manifestly than others. It hasn't really shown up yet uh, in the Northeast, although we're seeing some warning signs. But, it's the, but the uh, evidence is not quite as compelling just yet. 
nevertheless, there are certainly uh, people that make their livings on the on the waterfront in the Northeast, in the U.S. Northeast, uh, are paying attention, and a lot of those people are also taking uh, are being proactive. They're trying to future-proof some of their work so that they aren't impacted by ocean acidification to the same degree as folks on the Pacific Northwest. Uh, there are, for example, some shellfish species that are unique that are found in the East Coast. That have been sh it's been shown that contemporary levels of CO2 reduce their survival compared to pre-industrial levels. So current levels of carbon dioxide are affecting those species. Even though they're still alive, so you can still go out there and you can still buy them, but they're not as healthy as they were before we started burning fossil fuels. Uh, so that paints a rather uh, interesting and dark picture at times of, you know, a loss in this industry, um, changes in fish behavior and other issues. What do we have to look forward to? What are we doing about it? Well, it, like any complex environmental issue, there is no silver bullet. However, uh, there are a lot of things that, that we can do. Uh, in the short term, for example, the folks, again, using the Pacific Northwest as an example, they have been monitoring very closely the water that they use to fill their tanks at the hatchery. And so they will fill those waters uh, when the CO2 levels are relatively low. And then they'll treat them and they have managed to restore most of their production. Uh, they showed on the East Coast that you can actually use ground-up shellfish and you can buffer uh, acidified muds and bring those muds back to life. Um, you can also, in some estuaries, you can plant seagrass, which uh, assimilate a lot of carbon dioxide. Another um, intervention, in those areas where you have uh, a lot of agricultural input, for example, runoff from a farm that generates a lot of nitrogen and phosphorus that can lead to an algal bloom, those algal, those algae, when they die, release CO2. So you can create local pockets that are high in CO2. But that also creates an opportunity because you can say, we're going to find out where those sources of nitrogen and phosphorus are that are creating these algal blooms and we're going to decrease uh, the runoff. So those are just some of the strategies. But uh, for the long term, uh, there are a few things you can do. One is you could say, all right, now that we have some data, because it's essential for people to understand that um, ocean acidification doesn't have as much, we don't have as much data as we need to really take uh, sensible actions. The folks in the Pacific Northwest were able to take the steps that I just mentioned because they set up a rigorous uh, program of monitoring what we call carbonate chemistry, ocean chemistry, so they know exactly what they're dealing with and they were able to respond accordingly. Ocean acidification is one of those environmental issues in which we simply don't have enough data, especially in coastal environments. So that's really the key, is to set up a, a coordinated and rigorous monitoring network so we know what we're up against. But once you have those data, there are all sorts of things you could do. The steps that I just mentioned, but for example, imagine that there's a coastal ecosystem uh, that's important to a given country. And if you started monitoring carbonate chemistry, you say these levels are perilously low, I'm concerned. Well, one thing you can do is you can reduce other stresses. So I mentioned already you could reduce nitrogen and phosphorus loads from agriculture. You might decide that uh, you're going to minimize fishing pressure in that area, but you give those organisms a break. And you say we might declare this area a marine protected area so we can give it as much natural resilience as possible. And finally, you know, we recognize that uh, carbon dioxide emissions are part of the problem. Uh, there is no more informed, passionate, and eloquent voice f calling for reduced carbon dioxide emissions than a fisherman whose livelihood is threatened. People listen. People from industry move the needle. And what we're effectively doing by monitoring ocean acidification is we add voices to the chorus calling for sensible CO2 emissions. So tell us a little bit bit about the connection between the United States and New Zealand. Why was the workshop held here in New Zealand? Uh, well, as you know, New Zealand is a coastal nation surrounded by a lot of coastlines. So it's, it's, there's a lot of ocean to, to be concerned about and to want to manage appropriately. That's part of it. Um, also, the New Zealand shellfish aquaculture is dependent 
uh, depends heavily on uh, the greenlit mussel and the Pacific oyster. Those are both mollusks that build their shells out of calcium carbonate. So for the same reason they're worried about it in the Pacific Northwest, you would, uh, it makes sense to address uh, ocean acidification uh, here in New Zealand. And also, it's, New Zealand simply creates an environment where we can get things done. Uh, the key to addressing ocean acidification is to work in partnerships. Uh, those partnerships, in this case, would be between the U.S. and New Zealand. So, for example, it made sense to uh, bring the folks down from the Pacific Northwest, the people from government, industry, and scientists, and bring them to New Zealand so New Zealand could benefit from those lessons learned. Uh, so you've got that bilateral relationship, and the conditions were just favorable between the U.S. and New Zealand. The two countries get along well, and they get things done. Uh, also, there's a certain can-do attitude in New Zealand. People are straightforward, and they just look for solutions. And it's a place where you just simply can get things done. Uh, and lastly, it's a place where we could build constructive partnerships between government, science, and industry. So when you combine all of that, you have a very favorable working environment, a place where you can get things done, and a need because of the importance of shellfish aquaculture to New Zealand. So you mentioned partnerships, and that seems to be a theme throughout your work. Uh, can you say a little bit more about that, maybe the philosophy behind partnerships, or even the mm -hmm. science of, you started by saying, we need partnerships, so mm -hmm. maybe dig into that. It is a complex issue. Uh, you need buy-in from government because uh, first you need the funding, but also, as you know, you just need political will to get things done. You need industry because that's what brings in the jobs and the livelihoods and contributes to national economies. You need scientists because Although part of the chemistry of ocean acidification is very simple, you add CO2 to water, it becomes carbonic acid, that removes carbonate, that's chemistry 101, that's simple. Monitoring ocean acidification, though, is complex, and this is the stuff of chemical oceanographers. Uh, chemical oceanographers with PhDs that can come and uh, provide the necessary instruments so uh, stakeholders have the data that they need to make decisions. Thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you.